if you own an asset and it can be a coal plant, it can be a, uh, a CCGT, which is a, a, a gas, uh, gas fired uh, plant. Um, at one point, if you know you're going to have to close the plant at a certain date that is not uh, directly linked to its uh, performance. Uh, you want to make sure that you get to that end of the date as efficiently, uh, as uh, commercially viable and as safe as possible, which means that you're going to change your maintenance regimes, your investments uh, and the way you operate the plant. Uh, basically, you want to get it over the finish line uh, on its last breath. Welcome back to our second video in this podcast series where we explore the world of energy, the transition and how it will impact businesses and in particular your client base. My name is Senna Orshi. I'm your host today and this is Robin Cook, senior consultant of UMS Group, also a rugby player. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, as you said, uh, working for UMS Group as a senior consultant, uh, I have a background in uh, a large municipality in the Netherlands where I first um, familiarized myself with asset management, which is sort of core of what we do, uh, and also gives that uh, system to uh, guide companies through the energy transition. Um, after my, my uh, career at the municipality that I worked for, uh, I transitioned to uh, UMS Group, where I focused more on the energy transition and then in particular the role of uh, hydrocarbon plants uh, in that system and yeah, looking at the role they have until the closure dates in most countries uh, in 2030 or 2050. Yeah, well, looking forward at 2030, there's a lot of uh, climate neutral goals. They impact the whole world, but uh, in particular, the businesses that you work with, your clients. Can you tell us more about how it will impact your clients? Uh, obviously, throughout the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and the Paris Agreement, uh, we see that regulators, governments uh, set climate goals for their, uh, for their countries, uh, impacting the clients we have. Um, and what we see is that uh, the energy systems around the world are changing. Uh, different tempos, if we look at the United States, uh, Canada, uh, there's a, a phase out of coal happening from a commercial point of view. If we look at the European markets, we see that uh, there's a regulatory push for climate neutral uh, energy systems. And if you look at countries like uh, India, uh, China, uh, where the economic growth is still yeah, almost uh, facilitating still a growth of coal because their economies are still expanding. Uh, we see that the growth of coal is still, still impending there. But in the future, there is a chance that also in those countries, um, uh, coal will be phased out. So basically everywhere around the world, we see a phase out of coal is impending. Yeah. Um, and we try to help companies um, planning with their strategy uh, towards that, that phase out date with a, with a proper glide path. Can you explain glide path quickly for us? Yeah, basically it means that um, if you own an asset, and it can be a coal plant, it can be a, uh, a CCGT, which is a, a, a gas, uh, gas fired uh, plant. Um, at one point, if you know you're going to have to close the plant at a certain date that is not uh, directly linked to its uh, performance, uh, you want to make sure that you get to that end of the date as efficiently, uh, as uh, commercially viable and as safe as possible which means that you're going to change your maintenance regimes, your investments uh, and the way you operate the plant. Uh, basically, you want to get it over the finish line uh, on its last breath. Yeah. Uh, which means that in the last five years of running the plant, you're probably not going to do any major investments because... Or maintenance. Or, or maintenance, unless it's uh, to make sure it can operate safely and can operate till the last day. Um, and then if you have such a date, uh, and you know the way you want to get there, that's called the glide path. Especially in Europe, Canada and the USA, we are moving into a new era where coal is rapidly being replaced with other fuels. Mm -hmm. How is that uh, landscape looking like and how is it developing? Well, what you see is that uh, hydrocarbon plants uh, used to have a very strong uh, baseload operation, which means that they would operate at a certain level of output, certain amount of megawatts, and uh, it would help to keep it there as consistent as possible. Um, it gave a consistent output and therefore a uh, stable energy system. Yeah. And we see that with the um, 
with the incorporation of uh, renewable energy in our system, uh, the way they have to operate is much more, uh, it's much more dynamic. So uh, you can imagine if you have a very windy, sunny day, there's a lot of cheap energy in solar and wind, obviously, and um, running a coal plant or a, a gas plant is uh, less attractive. But in Germany, they have a word for the two weeks where it's cloudy and there's no uh, wind, which is called the Dunkelflaute. 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 Okay. Um, all of a sudden, uh, you need a backup system for yeah. your renewables. Um, because we don't want to be out of energy. Correct. And that's, that's the role that we see more and more uh, in that energy system. So a hydrocarbon plant that has uh, a lot of emission will only be used as a backup for the more renewable uh, and the more uh, or the less uh, energy or the less emitting uh, um, energy sources that we have, like wind, solar, and in some co uh, countries, the hydropower. We want to get as much renewable energy as possible, but we also want system security. Yeah, uh, I would because like it's to, not always stable. No, you, you, you can't, yeah, well, you can predict the weather in some way, but uh, you can't, uh, you can't change it. Yeah, we can't, ch we, can, we cannot ask for more wind or more no. sun. So, so uh, what you see now is that we need to uh, think about and, and restructure our energy system, where we uh, try to operate as much as we can with, um, uh, with low emissions. Uh, but then for the time where we have no renewables, we want some sort of backup system. And whether that's uh, a, a, a carbon emitting plant with a carbon capture system, or whether that is uh, by uh, capture or by using the excess energy in, in, in some time when we have an, an, an over capacity of wind and solar to uh, create hydrogen, for instance, or whether that is uh, by using uh, nuclear power. That is a choice that we have to make and it's a direction that you kind of need as well from your regulators in some countries uh, because that gives us uh, a perspective as well and that gives us uh, a direction to operate towards. Um, if we don't make those choices or if those choices are not well thought of, uh, you cannot just build a new power plant in a year. It takes 10 years for all the legislation to come through for planning, design, the building phase to actually get it operational. So it's, it's something that you have to think about before it actually, it is actually too late. Yeah. And, uh, an example we have there is the, uh, the black swan of the, the Russian Ukrainian war. Exactly. Where we, um, we subsidized the early closure of coal plants because there were, there were new coal plants in the Netherlands that we still use efficient plants but with a lot of emissions and we said that doesn't fit the energy transition strategy that we have so we're going to close them early but we'll make sure that it doesn't come at a too large loss and then all of a sudden uh, there's gas cur curtailment from russia the energy prices start rising and a coal plant's mission where it was uh, uh, obsolete first now all of a sudden is essential in making sure that we have cheap energy and then as a government and um, uh, as an energy provider, you're going to have to balance out whether you want to have clean power or affordable power. And that's the choice that we saw here and that we saw now, where we closed the coal plants a bit too early um, to resist a black swan like the Russian gas curtailment. And now you see as well that politicians and, and, and corporate life starts to understand the impact of such a black swan on the energy system and what that means for people that have to eventually pay the bills. We want clean energy, but we want a robust system as well. We want an agile system that's ready to adapt in case anything goes wrong or anything happens. Um, and yeah, that, that will be the main task for the, for the coming years, I think. And how do you think this uh, will affect the value chain? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, because obviously the, the value chain of, of uh, a coal plant itself is, is, is long. You have your, uh, your mining operations, uh, but you have uh, what we call brown coal, which is um, you, it's a cheaper and, and less efficient type of coal, uh, where usually the, the uh, operating power plant is built next to the mine so that you don't have the transport costs in there. Uh, yeah, closing a coal plant or at least not running it as much as you used to uh, will have a major impact uh, on the whole community around it because 
um, what you, for instance, saw with uh, with the car industry in in Detroit, with uh, with Ford closing its uh, its plants, you see a, a decline in a city because everything is built around, around the activity yeah. there. So if you go to a very mining intensive area where there's a plant and where there's also a mine, um, that whole community is built around it. So if you close one of the two, or if 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 work goes down there. Uh, it's going to have a major impact on the on the entire community, uh, and we've seen what happens in 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 uh, cities like like Detroit. I hope governments, regulators, uh, keep this in mind when they make decisions like this. Uh, obviously, in in the Netherlands, for instance, the situation is different because we have imported coal. Uh, we use a, a higher quality coal that we import from overseas, um, so there's there's less of an impact. Uh, on society with the closure of coal plants here. We also see that um, from research we've done uh, in the Netherlands as well, but we've done a global benchmark where we said, all right, what are the successful um, strategies when you close a coal plant? Um, and we only looked at the plant, we haven't looked at the community around it, was that most companies uh, made sure they offered uh, a future perspective for their employees. So either within the company, uh, or helping them um, uh, educate themselves to new industries, uh, but at least making sure there's clarity around the future. Yeah. Uh, because you can imagine if you get told, we might close in 2030. The whole I staff would, is going to be demotivated. You're demotivated. Yeah. Uh, I would be looking around for another job, yeah. where if I know 2030 we close and we're going to run this plan successfully until then, and when we close it, there's future perspective and you have uh, at least this experience, but will also help you uh, grow to a next career or the future career, then at least for me, that would be an incentive to stay and stay motivated as well. Because you can imagine if you go from a very uh, base load operation, which is a, um, a stable operation, to flexible operation, where you have to keep ramping up and down the activities and uh, everything becomes more dynamic, that comes with safety risks as well. Yeah. Uh, and if you have unmotivated staff that don't want to be there because they don't see a future anymore, then yeah, that, that causes a lot of safety risks. And if, you, if there's one thing that is really important with a glide path, it is making sure that it happens safely as well. No incidents, uh, uh, no casualties, just a safe operation until the last day. Yeah. I think many times I, I'm not really aware of uh, how it will impact the world, for me at least, you know, as a consumer. If we look at, for instance, the um, uh, electrical vehicles, obviously we want to uh, get as little emissions as possible, so we see a big shift into electrical vehicles. One electrical vehicle doubles the energy consumption of an average household. So you can imagine that uh, all of a sudden we need more electricity. Yeah. If we want to uh, move more electricity, and, and this is going a little bit back to high school, if you have a little thread and you want to put uh, a current through it, uh, you can't just keep uh, keep increasing the amount of current going through because it gets hotter, it starts glowing, and all of a sudden it will melt. The same thing happens in, in on a larger scale. So if we as a society go to more electrification, which we see in the electrical vehicles, but also uh, all of the houses uh, getting uh, or being disconnected Elect from gas, go yeah. electric electro heating, electric cooking, but also in the industry, uh, we start seeing e-boilers, we start seeing uh, electrification of processes. So uh, we see that the demand for electricity is growing and growing, and that impacts the whole value chain. So we need all the, uh, the, the power lines, for instance. We need them more robust. Um, if we as a society become more um, reliant on electricity, you want better security, you want better safety, because if something breaks down, the impact will be bigger as well. Um, but also, uh, on the uh, production side, if people need more e electricity, we need to produce more e electricity. But we're closing the conventional, conventional power stations. So all of a sudden, we're thinking about wind at sea, we're thinking about solar parks. And this is a new industry as well. It's, it's not until recently that we start actually noticing the impact uh, on, for instance, the environment of, um, of windmills yeah. or, uh, or wind turbines or uh, a solar park because it attracts heat, what happens with the environment around it, what happens to the biodiversity around it. All of those things are, are part of this uh, energy transition that slowly but surely we're starting to notice, we're starting to see, and that we need to adapt to, that we need to 
at least come up with uh, a plan or strategy going forward. Uh, we are pretty far ahead of the curve when it comes to the energy transition. Um, I think in, in Europe and the Netherlands, we're, we're, we have a, a strong focus in uh, creating an energy system uh, that is less revolving around carbon emissions or emission, emissions in total. But you have to imagine that developing nations haven't had that, that, that time we had already up until now. Um, we've had the economic benefits of it. It would be unfair to say to any other country, well, we're going carbon neutral, you have to as well, because they have this very long economic growth that, that they're going to miss out on. So Yeah, and they still need to get their fair share. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, or they should be compensated. But that's 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 a bit more my, my personal view. Uh, you can't uh, change your own setting and then demand everyone else to do it because you think it's the right thing or it's the right thing for the climate. If somebody else is being uh, um, impacted negatively by it, unless you compensate them or help out. And that is something that I think uh, developing nations should actually uh, should actually uh, uh, come together as, uh, for instance, the European Union. Maybe look a bit around and see where you can actually help implement or, or um, excel the energy transition. Earlier, we were talking about the black swan and how it uh, triggered a demand for backup. Mm -hmm. How does this translate into practical solutions? There's a number of solutions. One is uh, on the consumer side. We need to be aware of our energy consumption. Uh, we're all talking about energy transition and getting cleaner energy. But I think the easiest way to, uh, to create less impact of the energy system on the climate is by consuming less energy. So uh, think about what you use energy for and if it's really necessary. Uh, making sure that processes that we have in the industry or in your household become more efficient uh, and also have uh, more uh, diverse energy generation. So maybe uh, personal generation on, like we all do now on our houses with, uh, with the, um, uh, the photovoltaic uh, uh, the solar panels, um, solar boilers, uh, you name it. But those are, those are the first steps. Uh, then obviously we have the generation side of things where we want to make sure that the power that we generate is as clean as possible. And then if we have an excess of energy, that we are able to store it for when uh, the access to clean energy is lower, like in the Dunkelflaute. So thinking about battery storage, maybe hydrogen, uh, we see in, in countries that have a bit more high difference, you can use it to pump water up and, and use the water uh, for hydropower when, and, and make it come down again, uh, use that to generate power. Uh, but we have to be inventive, uh, I think. Okay, so that's uh, when, you, when we look at the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at, for example, investors or politicians. Yeah, I think um, on the political side, we need uh, politicians that are aware of the uh, energy system as a whole, as, of the energy sector, but also come up with a clear defined strategy and a direction. Um, I think a lack of direction uh, creates a very dispersed effort. Um, and I think if, if uh, people and companies know uh, what we're aiming for, what, what, what goal we're actually trying to achieve and how we want to get there, uh, it is easier to, um, to focus your efforts. Uh, if we look at investors, um, we see that for investors, it's important that you have a return on investment uh, that is more interesting for renewables. So make it more attractive to invest in renewable energy. Um, and if there's going to be investment in, uh, in carbon emitting plants, make sure there's a, uh, a phase out plan or backup plan. Make sure that there's, um, um, there's at least an idea of how to uh, step away from that investment because we see climate activism um, really puts you on the, on the pedestal when uh, and people hold you responsible as well for your investments. Uh, so as an investor, you want to be aware of that, uh, that if you invest in somewhere, yeah, you need to be uh, able to explain why, but also have a backup plan uh, and a phase out plan for your investment. What kind of challenges do you identify for your clients? The most current one for me uh, that I'm working on is the, um, the actual operational regime. So when you build or design a power plant, uh, you do that with a certain mission in mind. So it is either 
a backup plant or a baseload operation plant. Baseload means that it is there to provide a constant stream of energy. If uh, due to the changing market that changes, uh, you need to think about basically the whole power plant and all its crucial elements. So staff, uh, but also uh, your turbines. You have to think about the technical parts, uh, the operating modes, the safety, uh, the safety issues that, that can evolve uh, from changing your asset mission. Um, and that is something that is that is pretty hard to change without having the right processes in place. Uh, not just working processes, but also process safety. So making sure that everyone is aware of the changing operating regime in a plant like that. Um, then the other one is obviously, as I touched upon before, uh, retention of staff. Uh, any 20, 25 year old, I, I don't know a lot of them that are jumping up and down to go work in a coal plant or in a plant that is maybe part of a, an industry that um, will not be as active as it is now. Um, so what, what, what is your role going to be in that energy system? And if you can choose for a system that is uh, more attractive at this moment, then obviously when you're young and you're, a little, you're, you're an engineer, you're going to pick that industry because it has better career perspective. So how do you attract new staff, but also how do you retain your, your, your staff? And how do you make sure that they keep operating uh, motivated and that you understand what their role is in their energy system? And how do you support your clients in this process? For the actual changing asset mission, uh, we do uh, plant assessments. So uh, we start with a desktop assessment where we look at the plant design and its capabilities and its, its current performance. And we analyze uh, what its capabilities is if we would change the operating regime to a more flexible operating machine uh, regime. So more basically ramping it up and down. Um, then we uh, host a series of workshops about um, regarding the uh, crucial plant areas. Um, also uh, discussing with staff uh, where they see issues, uh, where they see possibilities. Um, and then we do modeling. So we take the, the current plant, we take its combustion uh, data and we create a model where we test already what happens if we change certain aspects of the plant. And then lastly, when we have the data from A, the assessment uh, and B, the model, uh, and we've conducted a site visit where we actually go see and feel with our own eyes and hands uh, what the situation is on the plant, we finish with uh, test trials where we test the plant um, in this new operating regime. So actually testing with the operators, with the staff available, um, how does it react? How does it respond to what we're trying to achieve? And is it possible and does it work? And what we've seen in the uh, projects that we've done so far is that um, we as UMS group have been a bit too cautious even uh, coming up with new targets where if we go back a few months, months later, the operating staff said, well, we've changed our culture, we've changed our way of thinking about this plant, and we're actually achieving way higher ramp rates or the, the low turndown goes way quicker. And all of a sudden, uh, you have your trading floor that sees your asset uh, as a new part in that energy system and the trading system, uh, if it's obviously a commercial market, if it's a regulated market for that system security. And all of a sudden, you see that uh, this new uh, asset mission becomes part of the DNA of the staff as well. And this is something that we do on the technical part. What we've done on the staff retention part, for instance, is conduct a global benchmark uh, where we uh, approached the major players uh, in the coal industry and asked them, um, what have you done to retain staff and to make sure that um, the closure of your plants was successful with zero to no accidents. And uh, what we've seen there is that there's um, uh, a consensus about, uh, like I said before, offering that future perspective, uh, f financial incentive, obviously, but mostly having that outlook on uh, at least being able to run the plant uh, in, a, in, a, in a good manner towards the end of, end, uh, the end of closure. And what do you think the impact uh, will be on the industry, hence on the market? Looking from an uh, from a, uh, a literally the, the, the industry sector uh, is that we are going to more uh, flexible operations as well. So uh, we, we touched upon flexible operations from a power production side of things. But now imagine your production process costs a lot of 
uh, energy and you need a lot of energy, electricity to generate or to produce. Um, but now you see that the tariffs for energy fluctuate with the weather. If you can adapt your processes and you can adapt your production processes to energy prices, all of a sudden, um, being agile like that becomes uh, part of your, uh, your business model. Uh, for instance, if, if you look at a, um, uh, in the dairy industry, we see that for, for, for uh, dairy powder, uh, it's basically uh, cooking milk until it becomes dry to, to really simplify it. If you can somehow adjust your process to only work with renewable energy uh, when the prices are very low, so when there's a lot of wind and a lot of solar, you can produce a, lit, a lot cheaper, but also a lot cleaner because you can actually prove that you produce power or produce your product with clean power. And I think that's going to be one of the future directions for the, for the larger industry. More flexibility. More flexibility. Um, and this is also where storage capacity comes in because you can't ask the industry to only produce when there's a lot of sun and wind because there's a lot of times when there's not. Yeah. So we need to be able to store excess amounts uh, of clean energy and make sure that we can use that to actually provide a, uh, a consistent production process. Um, but until that, yeah, maybe the incentive is clean yeah. and cheap power. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Wishing you loads of luck with that. In the meanwhile, we will keep having these conversations to just explore the different ways of, you know, uh, operating and supporting the businesses. Uh, please let us know your thoughts, your ideas, or your challenges. See you next time. <laughs>